Okay, so, in a mage game, I was the DM. The party consisted of the following shadow names in quotes. Allo T. Alan Mitwiker almost purely a life mage, by the end, probably the most powerful in an individual field, reached Arch Mage in it, basically the party leader, partially responsible for what happened. Valerie Sol Beverly Johnson party heart, kept most of the people together and mediated fights. Split her studies between death, matter, and prime, and while not quite as powerful as most of the others in individual fields, made up for it by bending said focuses together. Dr. Frost Michel Turing Prime Forces, probably the dullest party member as far as role playing was concerned, but still did pretty well. Character spent time working in a pharmaceutical, which, when you're magic, made obtaining stuff that the party normally wouldn't have a bit easier. Basically the muscle of group. Nick Nick Danny Moran the crazy, who managed to, despite using vulgar magic like a Mithurfica, almost never paradoxed, mostly focused on time, but did a couple of other things as well, was, honestly, probably the most powerful person in the party if only because she kept finding doing awesome things for plot and such, but due to the spread wasn't as powerful in each individual field as most of the other specialists in the party. It all started during a street fight against a couple at low level. Schmuck vampire. The party paradoxed quite a bit, but none of them bothered trying to see if this was because someone mundane had been seeing the magic they had been throwing about. Long story short, someone was. Well, problems started slowly arising for the party. Over the course of multiple sessions, they found that they were being tailed by people, strange folks would lurk around their domicile, and normal, non-insidious seeming people were distancing themselves from the party. Rumors of the party being a bunch of weird wannabe anarchists wiccans were circulated by normal folks, but it was just that, rumors, basically, they were ostracized, but nothing overt. The party was basically used to it, after all, the party, over the course of about 6 or 7 sessions, had pretty much made a name for themselves as folks who would banish terrible things from whence they came. Alan advertised himself as a gardener, which gave him the convenient excuse to have a shit ton of plants around. Beverly ended up working in jewelry, Michelle kept the pharmacy spiel going, and Danny? Danny banished poltergeists and advertised herself as a wizard for hire. The party, due to outside pressures, actually moved their characters under a single roof, if only for protection. For a while, all was well. The game effectively devolved into a sitcom, for a few sessions, and the party members got to bond a bit without their lives being at constant risk. When they had mage work that had to be done, they would try, and usually succeed, in getting rid of the folks who were tailing them. The only people who consistently failed were Alan and Danny, and while it caused the former a number of problems with Paradox, it wasn't anything that was going to kill him, more likely than not. Meanwhile, I'm rolling in the background like a Mithurfica, because the few times the followers managed to tail a party member, they'd try to bring a recording device. Each time, it adds to a greater and greater pool, where, once, it was only a couple of guys in trench coats, more and more shady people are getting interested in this party. Of course, the jokes end when someone burns down Alan's bonsai tree garden. Finally, the party becomes interested in who why the fuck they are being followed, and start looking for some answers. So, some background. Long story short, the original person who saw party member cast some magic had started most of the rumors that had plagued the party. This hadn't been much of an issue, but this had, for whatever reason, tweaked the interest of a local group of gangsters. And when more and more evidence of the party's capacity to do some funky shit arose, this got this. Street gang more and more intrigued. Originally, that wouldn't have been much of an issue, but when some of them went looking around for occult volumes texts, one of them had the grave misfortune of finding a legit tome of devil summoning. Just from touching the tome, the guy had gotten his mind basically hijacked by a lesser demon, and essentially walked the body and book back to the gang hideout to display what new power had been found in this book. This small group of gang members starts to grow as they start demonstrating goddamned miracles and instilling a loyal and terrified following to work as soldiers. These people are formed of the homeless, disenfranchised, and otherwise fucked over by society. Most don't exactly cooperate, but when they don't, they tend to get murdered as sacrifices for further rituals for devil summoning. So, while the party is investigating who, exactly, is responsible for following them, this group of thugs is engaging in what can only be called devil worshipping and some heartily fucked up shit for the purposes of summoning more and more infernals. 
with the ultimate goal of summoning an archdemon readers, basically, hell on earth. So, when the party finally manages to find a few of the gang members, they are possessed in jacked of shit. And here, ultimately, is where the story takes a turn from investigation to superheroics. The party goes back home and regroups when the whole gangsters have turned to legitimate devil worshipping and might be about to murder thousands of people to summon. Basically, Lucifer Bomb has been dropped. They, unanimously, agree that this cannot be allowed to happen. Not because it would bother them, but because it was the right thing to do. Fuck the police. The party suits up, basically starts prepping for war. From what little the party knows about spirits, they deduce that these particular infernals didn't normally need a circle or anything particular if they were weak, but the more and more powerful infernals required more and more problematic processes to summon. Thing was, though, was that the gang had recently moved shop to the old quarter of the city, and due to how the plumbing was arranged in this portion of the city, basically had about three stroke fourths of a circle required to summon an archdemon already done. They, the devil worshippers, had also been going on so called charity runs. And had been intelligent enough to use line their vehicles tires with blades that would scrape what was left of the circle into the pavement as they drove by. Furthermore, while the entire circle was useful, it wasn't exactly required. The entire circle would mean that the archdemon would instantly be at full strength, while having a mud circle would leave him at less and less power. Commiserator who damaged the circle was. The bigger problem, was, however, the fact that Mardi Gras was approaching. And the party was almost completely certain that the devil worshippers were planning on commencing in a bloodbath to end all bloodbaths on that day, to effectively jumpstart feed the summoning process. So, the party did the logical thing, they called in a shit ton of bomb threats all over the city before getting heading out. Burning their house to the ground as they did so so nothing arcane could be plucked from them in case something went horrifyingly wrong. A bit foolhardy, honestly, but they were paladinine the fuck out, and I wasn't going to stop such a beautiful thing from happening. Of course, when I brought up that paradox was still going to be a bitch to deal with, it turned out that they had come up with an awesome, if horrifying, way around that. Basically, a mage can split a part of their soul off and center it on an object to create a field where magic can almost never create paradox. In this case, they had drawn lots, and when Alan drew the short stick, Beverly said fuck that noise and did it to herself. This weakened her capacity to cast magic, which would prove problematic for her soon. Fuck the rules. So, the party goes out, basically finds the gang, goes into hiding to see what the hell is going on now that the gang doesn't have as many people to murder. The gang sends the homeless majority further ahead from the more heavily armed gang members. I pause and look at the players. I mention how some of the gang seem to be raising their guns. I pause again. I mention how the gang is now aiming at the homeless majority. I pause again and look at the players. It's only as I open my mouth to say more that Beverly's and Danny's players eyes widen with realization. And then, of course, the gang opens fire on the homeless people. The party had gotten it right. Calculating that the Mardi Gras festivities would be the way the gang would get enough people to fuel the summoning. They hadn't. However, accounted for the metric shit ton of, basically, enslaved homeless people the gang had been collecting as well. In this case, a fatal miscalculation. The party had failed. An archdemon summoning had occurred. By all rights, the party ought to be dead by now. They are effectively at ground zero, and are some of the few people who aren't corrupted to hell and back, and as such, stand out like a beacon in the darkness. But then Alan's player says something that makes me continue the game. We can fix this. The characters understand that this is basically the end, and as such, go forward with reckless abandon. Beverly dies in a hail of abnormally lucky gunfire in the first couple of rounds. Her soul stone, however, is still intact, and as such, the party's odds of paradoxing are really low. Have seen the end of war. Michelle and Danny pull their power together and effectively ice the entire street, killing most of the gunmen and lower tier possessed. However, Danny's unnatural luck for not paradoxing has run out. And he paradoxes so badly that by the time he finished rolling dice, he has gone from full health to being unmade from existence. He didn't just die from paradox, but actually managed to take more than double his health in lethal damage from the paradox. For those not in the no for mage, paradox normally deals bashing damage. If you take enough bashing damage, it becomes lethal damage. This poor bastard managed to roll enough critical successes on his own paradox roll to straight up be removed from existence and basically put in a timeout corner. Michelle, 
however, was the one the gods had given Danny's unnatural luck to. As she came out of the spell and marred, she continued her reign of terror by basically murdering all but two of the gang members, and the archdemon itself, Q Allen, who, as a life mage, just shoots the other two with a pistol. Nothing, it would seem, too memorable, except the fact that Alan still had all of his magical juice. Then Michelle tried to go into melee with the archdemon. This, it turned out, was a mistake, particularly without much magic to back yourself up with. She managed to stab it in the demon equivalent of the eye, but then got sliced in half for her trouble almost unceremoniously. That said, the party has done damned well, basically, everything but the archdemon is dead, and while it was unlikely that it could be stopped, they had put up a damned good fight. And then Alan went, for all intents and purposes, Super Saiyan. So, something I hadn't been aware of. While Alan was, indeed, an archmage of life, he was also a goddamn unarmed master. So when I tell him, basically, that this is probably it, he turns to me and says, my character accelerates his own bodily processes, and activates 100% of his strength via magical blood doping and removal of unconscious limiters. I blinked a couple of times, because I didn't know shit about biology or anatomy, but it turns out that people don't use most of their own muscular strength when doing stuff, because the amount of power people have is enough to rip tendons and shit off bones with said power. However, he had gotten around that by accelerating his own healing process to the umpteenth degree, and he had maxed out his character's strength. So, right as the demon starts monologuing about how useless it all is, and how Alan had better give up and other beg shit, Alan drop kicks him through a brick building and smashes the demon's face with a fucking vending machine. It wasn't much, but it hurt the demon a bit, who got back up. Only to be met with a barrage of punches and kicks that started making glass across the street shatter at the sheer noise of the impact. The demon is still kicking ass, mind, and manages to cleave Alan in twain. Which didn't really matter, because Alan straight up fused his two halves back together using magic trickery. Of course, then Alan reaches at the demon's face, grabs the knife embedded there, and wrenches it to the side as he fishhooks the demon's jaw in the opposite direction. It doesn't kill the demon, but it does, say, stun him for one round. Then Alan's player tells me that he wants to pull every last bit of magical and muscular strength into one last attack. In this case, a simple kick, upwards. Alan's character has been running out of time, since cells can only divide so many times, after all. He punted the damn thing to outer space. This is not an exaggeration. He, by literally pulling everything from what I ruled to be 20 strength and god knows how much magic, had managed to kick the thing so hard that, after rolling about one stroke to the dice necessary to account for everything and getting a crit success on about 10 of them, it was leaving orbit. This absolutely fucked the street and most of the surrounding houses, but due to the party basically calling in enough bomb threats to scare a small nation, nobody was dead. Except Alan. He had artificially aged about 60 years in about 3 rounds of combat, and his entire leg had just snapped off with that final strike. The party was well and truly dead. We all shook on it afterwards. While they were a bit sad to see every one of the characters go, they agreed that it had ended about as awesomely as could be reasoned, and seemed to enjoy it. While Alan wasn't technically dead when we concluded, we all know he was going through body-wide cell death for certain. That said, the players looked at me and all agreed that, despite the death, it had been worth it. If you haven't already check out my Redbubble portfolio, you might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time!